Hello, faithful friends. It's good to be with you again this afternoon. This is an afternoon. I'm recording this on Wednesday afternoon. Jamie records our Sunday school lesson on the, the telephone, and we had it almost finished a few minutes ago, about three paragraphs left, and the phone rang. So we had to start all over. So we have fun doing these things, it will be so much better when we can get back in our Sunday school class, see each other, talk with each other, and not have cell, phone, cell phones ringing. But anyway, it's good to be with you this afternoon. We are studying the earth is the Lord's, Psalm 24. We have folks in our Sunday school class that we need to continue to remember in our prayers. I'm sure you've heard by now, Dr. Bradley had a double bypass surgery on, on Tuesday. Uh, we got word from Cheryl that he had done well. We need to continue to remember him. Obviously, we need to continue to remember Linda Coffey and jo um, Joanne Barksdale. I did talk with Jim Basket this afternoon, and we need to continue to remember him after his surgery. He still has some pain. I'm sure there are others that I'm not aware of, but we do need to remember our class and those within our church. But, uh, um, our church will be opening Sunday from what we understand, and I hope that that goes well. Rock Wallace, Nancy and I have talked with uh, Logan Carpenter about starting, uh, coming back together. Uh, we don't think we're ready yet. That uh, I don't, I've talked to several other folks and they don't think we're ready yet, but when that time comes, we'll let everyone know, but I think that it will be a, a while in the future. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much that we do have a time to get together this way with our class. We ask you to be with these folks that I have mentioned and ask you to bring your healing power on them. Be with those who uh, help them and work with them. Father, we ask you now to be with this lesson as we go forward. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our lesson today, as I mentioned, is in Psalm 24. Let's read those verses as 1 through 10 as we start. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your head, heads, O you gates. Lift up, he, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. What is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So we begin this introduction, the worship of the book of Psalms. The collection of prayers and hymns we find in the book of Psalms is complex in its forms and themes and diverse in its authors and historical context. Some psalms may be read as poems. Others work best as personal prayers, community hymns, or conversations with God or the leaders of worship. Some, like Psalm 24, likely had specific purposes in the practices of ancient Israel's worship, while others were deeply personal laments or joyous praises. Psalms plays a unique role among the books of the Bible. The Psalms function both as a way for people to speak to God and for God to speak to us. They are both prayer and scripture. Our lesson points out the similarity between Psalm 24 and Psalm 15. I'd like to read Psalm 15, which is five verses. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill? Who, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, 
who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man who honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. We see in both these Psalms that they begin with acknowledgement of God's sovereignty over all the world, then moves with structured call and response between the congregation and the priests. In worshiping with the Psalms, the scope of the book of Psalms includes every aspect of a faithful life. Taken as broad collection, the collection known as the Psalter reflects the whole scope of human life. It expresses our experiences and teaches us how to live as God's people. Psalms plays a unique role among the books of the Bible. The Psalms function both as a way for people to speak to God and for God to speak to us. They are both prayer and scripture. Psalms reveals a diverse collection of forms, personal and communal, prayer, poem, song, and liturgy. The authorship of most of the Psalms is subject to debate. The Psalms are both prayer and scripture, humans speaking to God and God speaking to us. Entering God's presence in verse chapter uh, in Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is an entrance liturgy, a form of public religious worship as conducted. In one of the reference Bibles I read, it said that this Psalm, Psalm 24, may have been written to celebrate the moving of the Ark of the Covenant from Obed Edom's house to Jerusalem. Tradition says that this psalm was sung on the first day of each week in the temple services. Verses 1 to 6 tell who is worthy to join in such a celebration of worship. The Ark of the Covenant, the physical symbol of God's presence, enters the sanctuary, the physical symbol of God's dwelling place. The people request admission into the divine presence. Profession of faith, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The entire world is God's. We too were created and are part of the creation. The profession of faith in these verses confirms belief in the existence of God and in God as creator of the world and all that is in it, including the worshipers who speak these very words. They recognize God as one who put the world together, who shaped an ordered life out of the chaos represented by the roaring waters of rivers and seas. We here recognize that God is the owner and ruler of all creation, including the human race. A responsive liturgy, verses 3 to 6. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Although this psalm may have been written to celebrate the moving of the Ark of the Covenant from Obed Edom's house to Jerusalem, we need to look at it as it applies to us today. In verse 6, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. How does this apply to us today? Here we are asking to enter into the presence of God. Is this something like we are facing in our businesses and lives today? You must have a mask on to enter. Or when we are about to board an airplane and at the ticket gate, we must show our ticket or other places where we must show identification. Just last week, as I went to the pharmacy to pick up my medicine, I was ne it was necessary for me to show a personal ID 
because the method medicine that I was picking up was something they said was special. We see here the worshiper's request to see God's face is deeply personal. Entering the Lord's presence isn't about membership roles or orthodoxy. Rather, the first two requirements for those who are invited into God's dwelling place are to have clean hands and pure hearts. In other words, their actions and motivations are in keeping with the promises of God's reign. God's standards are subtle ethical considerations that shape faithful living. Clean hands do good work. Take care. Give. Pure hearts motivate the hands work. Yearning for goodness, carefulness, and generosity. Clean hands and pure hearts respond to what they have known of God, that God is a creator who makes everything and calls it good, who cares for all people and who gives generously. Clean hands and pure hearts can't be earned, only experienced and expressed. They are the ways we connect with, touch, and serve one another. Verse 4, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. The third requirement for the people of God is that they do honor or practice falsehood. The third requirement for the people of God is that they do not honor or practice falsehoods. Close on the heels of clean hands and pure hearts, the priests remind the people of their dedication to the truth. Service to God, whether to worship or to care or the care of the world, can't be built on deception. God's blessing will only be given to those who live in the truth. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. In the final verses of the psalm, Acts of worship establish the character of the one we worship. The people actively express wonder and affirm their faith in the one who created them, who put the world in order, in whose presence they live, in whose presence they live. The people living in truth with their clean hands and pure hearts enter into the holy place to worship. Verses 7 through 10. God now comes to be with the people, this recognizing God's physical presence in Christ and the lasting promise that God will forever be with the people. The phrase, King of Glory, is unique in this psalm. Its repetition five times in four verses is a rhetorical tool to emphasize God's reign and bring our attention to it. God's reign over the world stretches from creation, verses 1 to 2, to the presence of the Holy One living among us, verses 7 through 10. As part of God's creation, we practice holiness of hand and heart. A large part of this involves our allegiance to truth, verses 3 and 4. Through the personal holiness, we are counted among those who worship the Creator, King, and Lord. We receive God's blessings and we seek God's face, God's own presence. We come with open hands and open hearts to return to our Creator all that we have received. In summary, all of this may sound interesting, but how does it affect me and how do I respond? The qualifications to enter into God's presence, present, presence, aren't questions on an exam to be passed. Instead, they offer an invitation to look inside ourselves and discover God's own goodness at work there. The one who created all things, the earth and all the life that depends on it, including us, wants people who seek goodness and do what is good, not people who are good enough, as judged by the cultural or religious measures 
humans tend to impose. We like to keep count, but clean hands and pure hearts, hearts can't be counted. We also like to make sure that only the right people are included. But the invitation to clean hands and pure hearts can only be answered by looking honestly at our own lives. When we enter God's presence, what we are, be what we are becomes what we have to give. If our hearts are committed to truthfulness, we will open our hands in faithful stewardship. We will do meaningful work and give gratefully and generously. In the presence of God, all people, all God's people join together in praise. What about me? Truth is the key to our preparation for worship. The psalmist explains that the key element of purity and cleanliness is to seek and tell the truth. Truth is our deepest stewardship. God is the Lord of the earth and everything in it. Only when we recognize this can we practice proper worship and proper stewardship. We can only give God what we actually have. This includes not only our financial resources, but our energy, our time, our gifts. When we bring our truest selves to God, we can worship in gratitude and give with open hearts and hands. In Jesus, God made, believe, made believers or met with believers on lake shores, in homes, at tables, in short, in all places of everyday life. Worship of God and the Creator, the King of glory, is no longer confined to the church building, its rituals, or its priesthood. Pure hearts and clean hands are still important to worship, but now the focus falls not on church buildings and rituals, but on all the everyday places where God meets us. Each of us must think how this psalm affects me. Do I have clean hands? Do I have a prayer heart? Do I dwell in the presence of the Lord? Now we can be with the Lord at all times, and he is always present with us. We live, we work, and we worship in God's presence, in the sacred space of a church sanctuary, but also in all the spaces of our daily lives as they make sacred by God's presence with us. Let us close with prayer. Father, I thank you for this time together with our class, and we just ask that you bless us this week as we go forward. Help our hearts to be clear. Help our hands to be busy. Help our work to be for you as we meet with other folks and explain you to them. Father, thank you for all you have given to us, and we ask you now to be with us. In Christ's name, I